Right, uh, so thanks Jody for essentially inviting me and, and letting me to talk to you. Uh, so yes indeed, I, I am from Sydney Uni, so that, that, that comes the logo. Uh, and I'll tell you something as well, that you probably will want to sooner or later decipher where my accent comes from. So I'm Czech, so I come from Prague. Uh, so very far from here, but I've been here for the past 12 years at Sydney Uni teaching essentially parasitology to all the new vets uh, in New South Wales uh, primarily. So that's where the kids come from to become vets. So, uh, so that's the whole thing is that I want to say here on this slide is that uh, Neospora is a disease, right? Uh, and it doesn't know borders. Uh, it is essentially where the dogs are. So wherever you got a dog, you sooner or later got Neospora. So there is no country that would be spared. And therefore, Australia has got Neospora as any other country around the world. Uh, and I, I'll have to somehow. Yes. All right. Uh, is that better? Mm. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. All right. So uh, I'll try my best to explain Neospora. Uh, it's not an easy disease. It's not one of those that uh, one sentence does it all. Uh, it's got little intricacies, and that's probably why I like it. Well, I have been looking into it for the past 20 years, ever since I graduated. Uh, so I'll tell you, uh, hopefully, uh, a few messages that are important. Uh, so this is... Sydney Uni. I'm just giving you where, where I kind of spend my time during the day. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you, well, what do, does Neospora really matter? Uh, and there's always a cost. Uh, but we got industries that put money on, on things and industries that don't really put, uh, or they calculate it. And Neospora is not just a problem of, of your dogs. It's a problem of industry much bigger, essentially, is it, primary dairy or cattle industry, and, and there they put the money on top of uh, every single disease or problems, and they say that it costs them about $30 million, uh, but in dogs it's essentially unknown. Uh, so, and kangaroo is there as well for one particular reason that I'll mention it at the, almost at the very end. So, uh, neosporosis is the, called the disease itself, and the pathogen, the parasite, is called Neospora caninum. Just the name, like many other names that uh, come with this disease. Uh, so, but before I go into, into dogs, I need to introduce you to cattle and, and, and the role that the cattle plays and the role. Uh, it's played in the discovery of the disease as well and what we know very often. So we got cows and, and you got a lot of cows in Queensland here as well. And so there's about 28 million of them. And, and there's a range of diseases and in dogs you got a range of diseases as well. And, and what I point, want to point here is kind of this area here, which is neonatal mortality. Uh, so in cattle, Neospora causes neonatal mortality. That means that cows are bought. Uh, and that farmer sees that, and farmers want to investigate it. And that's why we know what, what, what happens in there. So uh, this is just a report from 2015 that MLA does, which is a society or sort of a uh, body that, that looks after health in, uh, in, uh, around Australia for, for sheep and cattle. And, uh, there are, I'm a parasitologist, right? Parasitologist is not the person that studies viruses or bacteria, but little bigger things, like uh, you may know cattle ticks. Uh, so we got dog ticks, which are the paralysis ticks that you got here as well, and heart worms and intestinal worms, also the smaller ones, which are the, the protozoa, and one of them is Neospora. So uh, I study them all, and if you're interested and you want any, we got any questions about other diseases, but. Uh, Neospora, you can also ask me afterwards, there's no problem. So I usually cover all the parasites uh, in, in animals. So, uh, so Neospora is a problem. It's not the biggest problem for cows, uh, uh, yet we do care about it. Uh, so what else have I got here? Uh, so before I came here, I actually wanted to figure out how many dogs are around Australia. Uh, and you probably all know it, I didn't really know. Uh, but I learned, I learned on the RSPCA website that, where they told me that uh, we in Australia are uh, kind of nuts about, go nuts about dogs, that there's 
uh, about 63% of Australian households own a pet, and most of them are with dogs. So we got a lot of dogs here. Uh, and about four million, four million dogs around Australia run around or are, are cared for. So uh, that's a large proportion. It's not as many as cows, but there's a lot of dogs as well. And now the question is how many of those dogs are potentially affected by Neospora or have the potential? So uh, that's one of those questions that I'm trying to always answer and trying to relate to, to you owners or, or, or breeders. Uh, so. And because we really don't have any numbers associated with it, can't give, I can't give you how many millions does, does Neospora cost. It's an unknown number. Uh, so, uh, so why are we here? Uh, why are we here is what you see as an owner or a breeder. Uh, and essentially, in most cases, if you're dealing with Neospora, you're dealing with something that looks like this. Uh, it's a puppy. Uh, uh, that has got a problem and sits and has got stiff legs, stiff back legs. If for a vet, this could be a challenging issue uh, because it could be a trauma, could be a lot of things, could be a lot of non-infectious things. Infectious thing, by that I mean that there is a, an agent of disease that is being spread and being in, or infecting, like a flu uh, that infects that animal. Or there can be non-infectious agent that could be metabolic problem or degenerative problem or other problems that, that or traumatic problem that can cause this. So uh, for you it is disturbing for vets. It should be a kind of uh, point where they start to investigate. Uh, and it could be Neospora but it may not, right? Uh, that's what's important to realize that this is just a sign or sign that you see. Uh, it doesn't immediately implicate that it must be Neospora. And further investigations are really required to, uh, to figure out that indeed or not really uh, it's Neospora. And we'll cover the things when you can actually say it's Neospora. I can tell you that this bulldog was really affected and, and is one of those classical cases that, that have been uh, so it was at the kind of the discovery part of this, uh, of this disease, this puppy. So, uh, so the, the discovery, it's a very new disease, right? Uh, or or in, a, in some sense, I mean, uh, do we call uh, 80s old times? I don't think so. That's relatively recently. Uh, I re do recall that time in the 80s. Uh, so it was discovered in the 80s. Before that, it was essentially bundled in with other diseases and, and essentially ignored. Uh, so there are these two papers that essentially, that's what scientists do. They, they write stuff and people read it and hopefully vets will uh, translate it and use it with you. Uh, so I'll, t I'll tell you something how it became uh, uh, so, so important. So it was, it was in Scandinavia where there was a bitch, uh, this box of bitch, and, and essentially it gave birth to six puppies. And, and sooner or later, uh, five of them became uh, severely ill uh, with neurological signs. So uh, they barely walked, uh, back legs were, were weak, and unfortunately they all, all, all were euthanized. Uh, and they're very it's always with, with vets, they're always those that are very keen and investigate further. Uh, so this time I was lucky that there were a couple of vets that really wanted to figure out what's going on. And so they did all the tests they could and actually found something that they have never seen before. Uh, and essentially published it as unknown thing, as an unknown thing that, that they had no idea. And it took another four years before people started to s recognize this further uh, and recognize that it's a real, real problem, uh, a unique problem that is not just uh, something that we've seen before. Uh, so that was first boxer. So boxers were at the very, very start of that. Whether that's because they were liked at that time in, in, in Europe or not, I don't really know. But uh, uh, the other was America. Now, they've seen something in Europe. And another classical case that, that really has been published a lot is about Labradors. So this Labrador, which again gave birth to several pups, and half of them were affected. Essentially the same way like you've seen before, the puppy. Uh, and this time it was really rapid. That's what they recognized, that once uh, the clinical signs emerged, 
it was very much within a week, all of them, all of them, or half, the four, were affected. And it started as a one leg, and then both legs, and then it gone further to front legs, and then they were unable to swallow and essentially uh, had to be euthanized as well, uh, because they were, it was not, uh, uh, they essentially couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't eat. Uh, so that was where cases where people started to uh, started to not really freak out, but started to recognize that there is a real problem that is that something needs to be done, and obviously it has. Uh, and and there's still uh, these two cases, the box and this Labrador, are kind of the key ones where people go back and and recognize that uh, or learn from. Uh, so. This is what happened. So, uh, so at that time, people didn't know why is it all happening. And it's always very important to recognize why things are happening. Uh, so, so we move our legs because of neurons. So there is a signal sent from our head into the, into the back leg or front leg of our arm. Uh, and the problem with this is that if we lose the neuron, we'll never recover the same one. We've got a set number of neurons in our heads. And if we lose one, we go just minus one. And eventually we lose them all, and then we die. Uh, or we lose some, and we can't move with one leg or the other. Uh, and that's what, unfortunately, Neospora is uh, doing. It's killing our neurons. Uh, so normally, you've got neuron that looks like this flower, right? Uh, so you've got flower, and then you've got stem. And this is, this is in your brain. Uh, and this goes towards your muscle. Uh, and there is a channel that kind of channels the signal the, the, to the muscle. And Neospora loves that. Uh, and that's, that's part of the problem because it destroys it. Destroys the channel, destroys the communication uh, towards the muscle. And that's what essentially happens. That the parasite finds the place, uh, destroys the place, and never, the cell never grows back. And therefore the muscle has no signal and that's what happens. The, the muscle becomes rigid, uh, stays, uh, stays not affected, and it very much becomes like if you would have an arm in a plaster cast and leave it there for a few weeks, then you take off the cast and your arm very much looks very, very thin because the muscle basically disappears because of non-functionality. And that happens to the dogs as well if they uh, kind of survive the initial phase of, of the infection. So uh, now I got this is how the muscle or the, the neuro, essentially the neurofiber looks. It's like concentric kind of covering of that. It's like a you got a wire and you got the insulation around. Uh, and what the neospora does is you got still the wires here going through this insulated uh, so this is the neuron, this is the insulation and this is all these cross sections, like the, the, these little round things. That's the parasite. It's right in there. So it attacks the, the specific cell. It really loves the, the neurons. So if this is the axon, it's the name for the, 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 the wire that kind of connects the brain to the muscle. And all these guys, those are the parasites that multiply that. And as they multiply, they will eventually burst and destroy that. And, uh, and signal stops very much like would cut the wire and light stops. Uh, so that's unfortunately what the neospora does. Uh, and that's what I just told you, that once you lose the neuron, you can't get a new one. Unfortunately, that's one of those, uh, well, one of those cells that we can't really get a new one. Uh, what happens, what is replaced by, it's essentially replaced by a scar, so sort of uh, essentially, I would cut yourself, scar comes in, and that's it. So at the end, the muscle is full of little scars. Uh, then when pathologists cut the muscle of these, uh, these, these dogs and puppies, it's full of little scars uh, that were uh, caused by this, this parasite. Uh, so, so this is why we're here. Again, I'm showing you that, that pup. That's why it's happening, because the parasite killed all the... All the the, the wiring towards the muscles. Uh, so the dog really uh, barely moves and has to use its sort of back muscles to move. So the clinical signs often looks like that the, the puppy is kind of hopping like a bunny. So keeps the legs straight and just lifts them up and 
hops like a bunny, uh, not really the normal uh, uh, walking or running of the dog. So uh, that's a sign that's uh, typical. So this was a little bit of intro. Uh, and, and I'm here to also kind of educate you a little bit. And, and the, the, the educate always comes as how. How can I prevent it? That's what you always want to know. Uh, and I think that's a legitimate question you should always ask. Uh, do we have all the answers? We don't, but I hope we will give you some, some sort of uh, recommendations that will help you uh, to, to make uh, conscious decisions what you do. Uh, the biggest question that I always get about Neospora is where does it come from? Uh, where did the dog... Because we always tend to blame, want to blame someone else but ourselves. Uh, so I'll explain that too. Uh, and also about the testing, uh, we'll, we'll cover that, right? And a little bit about the medication, but that's really for the vets to deal with. Uh, uh, and I'll leave it for the vets mostly anyway. Once you point out Neospora, once they, they understand Neospora, there is plenty of information out there to find, uh, find what medication has to be, has to be done. Um, so, I already mentioned Neospora is a complicated one. And I, if I teach my students, the future vets, uh, Neospora is the tough one. It's like when, when they're aspiring towards HD, I give them Neospora. And if they get it right, they get HD. Otherwise, they get pass, kind of, right? Uh, so uh, they fail total Neospora. I shouldn't pass them at all, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, so I had to work with them more. So, uh, so don't feel bad that you don't get all the nitty gritty bits of it, uh, because it's not something that that uh, that is easy. And uh, so anyway, going back to Neospora. So we got uh, the dogs, and I always have to include the cow. Uh, there is no way that I can ignore one and. Uh, just prioritize the other. So dogs and cows, that's what, what, what happens. Now uh, imagine the life cycle, imagine, imagine how does the parasite exploit that relationship. Uh, and, and once you start to imagine that, you're probably starting to figure out how the life cycle works. So to, to start off, uh, I need to say a few things, and that we all familiar with infectious agents that we kind of spread easily from one to another. Classic example is a flu, right? If someone has got a flu, will sneeze here, and three days later half of you will be sick, right? And you're blaming, oh, that's I got it because I was there. Uh, Neospora is smarter. Uh, uh, so, so it doesn't go through this simple route. Uh, so if there's one thing you should remember, it's you can't get, or a dog can't get Neospora from another dog, right? If there are two dogs mingling together on a dog park and one is Neospora positive, the other one is not, no way. There is no link. There is nothing to be worried about. The, the Neospora positive dog that's kind of looking healthy uh, has no, uh, no medical, uh, sort of clinical, uh, issue itself to run around, even if it's got issues with running around, it doesn't spread it like sneezing or contact. Uh, and that's the same with cows. So neither of these hosts, uh, so how could they get it? Can anyone guess? It's through eating, exactly. That's another way, because that's what we all have to do. Uh, so. Uh, so that's what, what is very important. There is a lot of people actually call me, they worried about, about uh, can I actually walk my dog if it's Neospora positive? Can I go to a dog park? Uh, should I even tell anyone that my dog is Neospora positive? I say, well, tell, there's no problem. The, the, that's totally fine. It's not really infectious through the contact at all. Uh, so if you remember that, that's a very good uh, one piece of information that should be uh, kept. So the, really the root of transmission is this. I, I call it kind of active contact, which is eating each other. Uh, so of course you can imagine eating the dog eats a, a piece of cow. Uh, and if you want to, I mean, yeah, dog can get it from a dog as well. But you can imagine cannibalism as well. But that's relatively rare. 
uh, that's not a, a something that is common and that won't happen really in a, in a dog park, uh, usually, George, right? <laughs> Doesn't really happen that often. Uh, so, uh, so that's the whole, whole point. Uh, the classic carnivore kind of dog is a carnivore, so wants to eat uh, some sort of a piece of meat. So if it's a cow, may get Neospora visi. Uh, I'll focus on cow because we know most on a cow. There are other animals that potentially are the source as well, uh, but we know much less about them. Uh, so essentially that's why I got this here, kind of. That's, that's what uh, dogs like. You throw them a piece of bone or a piece of meat, they'll swallow it in no time. Uh, that might be one of the roots of transmission. So that's between the adults, right? Uh, but how about cow? Where did the cow get it? That's not a carnivore. I have never seen a cow eating a piece of meat. Um, so where could that one get it? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll bone make you guess or tell me, I'll show you, right? That's the dog there. So the Neospora goes through different phases in dog, uh, only in dog. No other animal will be able to shed in its feces a, a, a parasite stage. There's no other animal that we know of, just dog. You can talk about dingo or coyote or, or hybrids and all that, depending on what part of the world you are, uh, or wolf but nothing else. No fox, no cat, no, I don't know what. Uh, what else? Name the animal? No. Uh, so dog can shed it, uh, that parasite, into the environment. And because the stages are very resilient, they'll stay in the environment for quite a while, often several months and sometimes even years. And potentially cow or herbivore comes and will graze it up with the, with the grass. Now, should you worry then about dog? I wouldn't, because dogs really uh, uh, shed the osis very rarely. I think I got it on the next slide. Here I'm just trying to say how it works for a cow. So either it's from a dog, or the next phase is actually the intricate one where the parasites, what, what do parasites want? Parasites, if you think that parasites want to kill an animal, that's very wrong. Parasites, what they want is to find a next host. So if parasite can penetrate into the sort of offspring pathway, so if, if the parasite can get right in the mother into its fetus, that's the best thing what they can do for their own fitness. Because they avoiding or the whole thing of moving from one another of, through outside environment that can potentially be harsh. So if the parasite can actually find a way to its offspring or to the offspring of the animal that is there, it's perfect. So from that point of view, Neospore is one of the perfect parasites out there. It almost doesn't need anything. It can just stay in the host and whenever the host has got a baby, it will move on. And in between, it will just fall asleep and sleep until Again, there is another pregnancy. So from that point of, it's a perfect parasite. Uh, and, but it's not 100%. Not every calf will be positive, right? That's just to start off this discussion about that. So with dogs, this is the slide I thought that I already talking about. Not every dog will be shedding the osis or the, the parasite. The parasite in the feces looks like this. Uh, very hard to find. Uh, one time I was trying to find it, I had to go through 10,000 feces of dog, and I found only three. Three dog, three dog poop samples that were positive. So I had to go through a lot of buckets of, of, of poop samples. Uh, but I found it, and I'm probably, I'm one of the rare people that actually seen it. Uh, so there were probably there's 20 records, let's say roughly 20 records, and I, I have seen four out of the 20 in the whole world. Uh, so, so there's not, not, from that point of view, you should see that it's not a very easy thing to find this. So not every poop sample that, that is out there is positive for that. Therefore, not every dog, and almost no dog, is shedding osis. Because if it sheds, it sheds only once in its lifetime, and usually in probably like a two, three week period, no more. Nothing else. So within a lifespan of a dog, let's say 15 years, there will be only and 
potentially only just a period of two weeks, three weeks that it sheds. So it's very rare, uh, very rare to, to find a positive dog. So not dogs, most dogs, 99.9% .9 of dogs are negative on the feces uh, if you, if you uh, would be trying to find it. It's a it's essentially what I call looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, I found this on the internet. Uh, hopefully that's not me. Uh, uh, it was me once, uh, but I luckily found the needle, uh, and that's enough for me uh, with that. Uh, so, so some vets will, you can request the test, but I can already tell you that, that it will be negative unless you're super lucky. And even if you're super lucky, it's a very hard parasite to find. It's not an easy thing. It's in very low concentration. So, so uh, don't worry about it, really, looking for, for it in feces. Uh, I can only give these projects to poor students that, that I want to challenge them, and then they have to go through buckets of, of fecal samples. And, and, and at the end, they say, I found nothing. I say, well, that's what I expected. Uh, so uh, so that's sometimes when you want to punish a student. Uh, 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 but it's, they learn. They, they, that's how they learn. Uh, so, so now, so what, what other tests do we have? Uh, that's what you want to know. Uh, so the other test is, is serology. So essentially in our bloods, we got uh, red blood cells. That's why we got blood red. And there is a liquid. The, the blood cells are suspended in some sort of liquid. It's called serum. Uh, it's all, all, the, all the good stuff uh, that we use for our cells to survive. And as part of it, there are antibodies. It's like uh, little proteins that kind of recognize bugs and and and. and and kel kind of can kind of knock off or remove or kill uh, kill the parasite, and that's what you do when you do serology. You want to look for these these antibodies, and uh, so that's when you, when vets are requesting serology. Uh, so how does serology work? So this is a graph, right? So uh, forget everything, but look at the graph. What happens? This is how much of the antibodies is over time. This is time in the serum of a dog. So imagine the dog is infected here. And for the first two weeks, roughly, there is nothing. You can't detect anything. So it's got already the disease, probably. It's already sick, limping, and, and, and nothing. Because it takes time for the body to produce these antibodies. So only after that, you kind of go up. And then you've got the antibodies. And then the antibodies essentially stay in the body for the rest of the life of the animal. Uh, for Neospora, it is very, very much true. For some other disease, it doesn't stay forever, but with Neospora, it's, it's staying forever. So, when you're testing your dog for Neospora, and it's positive, it means what? Well, it means that it had Neospora in the, or it has Neospora, it had the, it had the clinical signs, may have, and that's it. I can't tell you the time. I can't tell you how far back. Because this is, this could be, you're testing it here. The dog is five years old. And it could easily have happened five years ago. Or it could have been here, which is just four weeks ago. So with the test, there is no guarantee, or there's no information, doesn't come with that information, how many weeks or months or years uh, it was. So that's very often when people kind of come to me, I give them the test, I tell dog is positive with some sort of a level of antibodies, and they ask, well, so when did it happen? I say, I don't know. I simply can't tell you. Uh, so that's, the test can't tell you. We have no test to actually tell you when things happened. Uh, so uh, that's something about serology, because that's what you will be getting as, a, as dog owners, that you send samples through the vet to a diagnostic lab, and the result comes positive. And then you will be asking, well, for how long, and, and all that. So unfortunately, there is no such information that comes with this test. So a few more things about this serology and, and the neospora. Uh, before, uh, so. It's all past infection. So the, the test that you got is something in the past. It can be anything from two weeks when it happened up to essentially many years. Uh, the animal remains 
infected for life. The parasite doesn't die. It simply just insists and stays as a dormant sleeping cell forever, uh, for the whole life of the animal. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, and essentially that's the same thing, plus the parasite is alive and causes no disease. So essentially the positive dog, if you've got a dog that's healthy, you test it, uh, and it's neospora positive, should be alarmed. I say no, that's fine, uh, as long as, for example, you're not planning to breed from, from that if it's uh, a bitch or damn. Uh, then don't worry, it's, uh, the animal will have a perfect life and in majority, and I mean majority is 99.999%, uh, it will have totally normal life like a negative one and you will not even know that it had ever Neospora. So don't be alarmed, if it's Neospora positive, it doesn't mean uh, anything serious to the livelihood of the animal. Uh, so that's what uh, is a good uh, good to know. Now, so where is the problem? Where do I have a problem? Where do people have problem with Neospora? Uh, and I'll use cows as an example because this, the dog it works very similarly. Uh, so I told you that cows will pass it onto the, onto the calf, but not always, but with some chance. Uh, uh, dogs the same. Dogs will do it the same. But there is a big difference. How many calves do cows have usually? Usually one. When you've got two, farmers don't like it. There's always potential for, for problems with two. But with puppies, do you want one puppy? No. No, you want few. You don't want 20, right? Uh, but 10 is good, probably. Uh, and so, so the, the chance, if there is a chance that uh, the, the calf will get it one in five. You got potentially each and every one of them of the puppies got the chance one in five. So you will end up with some getting the parasite, some not getting the parasite. Um, so almost you get with one one litter of puppies, you get the the five or ten years of 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 cow's life. That's how many kind of. Uh, cows will get and each has got individual chance of getting it. So uh, that's a little bit of that problem in there. Let's talk more about the cow before I move on to, 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 uh, to dogs. So call it part one. Don't worry, there's only part two and then it's the end. Uh, right? uh, so the, this, it's the paradigm of, do you cons this is, is this the right thing? Uh, the good news, bad news for a farmer. Uh, of course, this is the obvious thing. Aborted calf, it's a bad news. Uh, you're essentially losing the whole lactation and you have to start again. Uh, the good news is obviously good news. Happy cow, happy calf. Uh, but is it really the case when you start to think about Neospora? And, and let's skip this diagram. That's, for, that's too academic. Uh, uh, I was told that I shouldn't put that diagram there. I insisted. Uh, now I'm skipping it. Uh, so, so I showed you this picture, right? So it was a cow, calf, and what happens next? Well, the most important thing is always to consider time. So the little calf that has got some chance uh, to acquire the Neospora will grow. So it will become like mum. And if it's got the parasite, it can potentially pass it on to the next one. And again, and again, and again. And it's what is the vicious cycle. It keeps coming and coming, coming back. And that comes the problem. So who is who in this case? So we got good news, we got bad news, and unfortunately we got the ugly news as well. Who's the ugly one? Well, it could be one of those, easily. And I, can I tell them apart? I can't really. Well, for me, for, for an owner, uh, you look at it, they all look the same. They're both on the sides. Well, this is obvious. But those on the sides look absolutely identical. Uh, so how, how can I tell them apart? Which one will be the risky one? Which one will be the, 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 the kind of the safe one? 
Um, so that's essentially the question. And that is called congenitally infected cow, meaning that acquired the infection during the, uh, while it was uh, in mum. So that's essentially uh, one of the questions that everyone is asking. How do I know? Well, who's the good one? Who's the bad one? Uh, and because f dairy farmers, they care about pregnancies, right? So they have been able to calculate the risk factors and odd ratios and, and statistics, to put statistics on the numbers. Uh, and, and that is the number here, that, that seropositive congenitally infected heifer uh, has sort of seven to nine times more likelihood uh, chance that it will abort in its first pregnancy. That's what we got for cows. We will never reach this number with puppies and on your dogs because we would, I would need probably 5,000 liters and monitored individual puppy to come up with some statistics to give you some chances. So uh, we got it with cows because farmers in California in Netherlands cared and, and monitored about 10,000 cows. Uh, we will not reach that, uh, that benchmark for, for, for dogs, right? So we got some limitation here. Uh, so how do we test? How did the, the farmers test it? Uh, it's a congenitally contracted disease, so in mum. So mums protect us, right? So the first kind of, when we were born, we sucked immediately mum and got the best stuff out of mum, which is called colostrum. That's the very much the first milk we get. And animals do that as well. Mum gives us everything she's got, all the, the protective uh, sort of antibodies in it. So we have to, if we want to know that the, the calf or puppy is actually really infected in utero, in in mum, we need to test, or that's what they essentially decided, to test. The moment the calf is born, they test it. They bled the calf before it had the first, essentially, uh, first sort of uh, colostrum uh, uptake. And based on that, they calculated all these risk factors. Uh, so it's, it's tricky. Uh, the biology is built to protect, right? Uh, uh, so, so this is pre-colostral serology, so before the colostrum is taken. Uh, anything after that is a little bit tricky because it's a mixture of antibodies that the calf is producing, potentially, and the mix of the antibodies from the mum that was given through the milk. Milk is rich, or the, the colostrum is especially rich in all sorts of goodies. So, so that's a little bit tricky. So. They had to overcome this by testing very early on, uh, right? So with the, with the cows, we know this. This is like the nuts and bolts of when I talk to farmers, right? I tell them that very much studies show that first pregnancy from congenitally infected uh, 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 calf will end up as a pregnancy uh, that will fail as an abortion. And, but there's no... no not that bad news in a sense. Yes, you will lose one or two calves, but the third and fourth and fifth pregnancy will be fine. It will be delivered at term. Uh, so that's, that's what uh, the management strategy very often is for, for dairy, dairy farmers. We know all this because farmers allowed us to do all this, this, this work. Uh, so now we're finishing with cows, right? Uh, done with a cow. Uh, it's, it forms a benchmark, it for, kind of forms the knowledge base for, for the dog, to understand the dog part. Uh, part. So this is what happens there, this is what happens here. That's the same. There is no real evidence that there would be uh, abortions or uh, anything, any pathology during the pregnancy with the, with the puppies, uh, with the dogs. Uh, so far, no evidence. Uh, and people have looked how many kind of uh, in a general populations of dogs compared to those infected. If there were some mortality, they can't find difference. So, uh, so far, it doesn't look it causes uh, abortions or resorption. Dogs are very good in resorbing the, the fetuses. Uh, uh, that would be affected. So that's, that's just to clarify that. In cattle, on the other hand, it's not very common to have these 
paralyzed calves. It's very rare. Uh, they just are bought. Uh, uh, so that's it. So we come to this, right? We got a mum, and it's got many puppies, uh, and that's that's absolutely normal. That's how it should be. Uh, so this is your question: How do you know that there is a risk or there isn't? Uh, you know? So, so I, I tell you one thing, and it's very simple: just test whom. We test the mum. If the mum is negative, where would the parasite come from? From nowhere. The serology tells you past exposure. That means, as what I told you, that once you got serology positive, the animal is infected for life, forever. Uh, if it's a breeding bitch, that means it's got a living parasite inside. Can look totally asymptomatic, totally healthy, but unfortunately, at the time of pregnancy, we need to, or animals, or as we, have to deal with what? We have to deal with a foreign body. The half of the material in there is not ours. It's not the, the bitches. It's the, the sires. So the, the immune system has to be a little dampened down. And that's what the parasite exploits. That immediately uh, kind of takes over and spreads onto the fetus. So it's, it's, it, it's kind of finding ways through the, the biology of the host, which is the dog. Uh, so, so we're testing serology. We can test the mum. And if you test the mum and detect or the, the bitch is negative, therefore you don't have a problem. You don't need to even look for any signs. There is no problem, right? So remember that. Uh, so that's what I say. You got down, serologically negative, fine. No need to worry. Uh, then you got seropositive, you should uh, be aware. Uh, don't be extremely alarmed, but be aware, uh, I would say. Well, it sounds like the, the cattle situation, so that's why I introduced it. Uh, so what will happen next? Uh, well. I'll tell you that the cow is not a dog, and dog is not a cow, right? Uh, uh, because of these things, that uh, we got one dam, many pups, one cow, one calf. Uh, and so it's not easy to translate this. Uh, and some of the recommendations and some of the information on the internet about Neospora is really based solely on cows. Uh, and it's often mixed up, so don't always trust everything. Uh, and um, so that's why I'm trying to put that here. That, that's not how it works. So with cows, we got these numbers, right? So uh, transmission has got these percentages and 7.4 times more, more risk, etc., etc. We have no idea with dogs. I, I can't. I can say maybe, but we have not enough information, not enough follow through all the litters uh, to actually tell anything that would be sound and, and, uh, and trustworthy. Uh, I'll show you some information that we have so you can build your own picture. Uh, so let's do that. Um, so one of the best studies is on these, these breeds. Uh, do we have this breed in Australia? Yes. yes? Uh, so this is a, I, I like the breed. It looks really nice. Uh, and, and they had a big problem in England in, in the kind of 90s with this because essentially all of them were kind of affected. Uh, and it was the first kind of breed that actually took an action where they uh, made a mandatory testing of all the bitches, all the bitches that were positive, they neutered. And, and uh, they actually got on top of the, the problem with Neospora. Uh, and because really they wanted the, the club of these, uh, they wanted to investigate, they followed several, several, um, several litters, uh, uh, quite a number of them. And I'll show you a few here. So for example, this HS1 was positive mum with rather high titer, so it was quite a lot infected and there was a lot of antibodies floating around. Uh, and two litters. And if you go, the, the white ones means that there was no, no information about the pup. Individual square is a pup. Uh, the red ones means that it was seropositive, the puppy. Uh, so there was 
low of puppy seropositive and those that are bolded are the ones that were clinically affected. So this information essentially tells that one mom gave two liters, one after another, and passed it twice, right? Uh, at least. There's no more, there's no more follow-ups. No one's got in front of the third, fourth, fifth litter was still affected. Uh, and this is information that says, well, one, it will come with the second. We don't know whether the third or fourth will, will be the same. Uh, then there are other ones uh, that, that had sort of, uh, again, the next one is same, and the last, last one on, the, on this slide is 1 to 800, and the two blue ones mean seronegative. So it had relatively lowish, uh, lowish titer for the serology, uh, and didn't pass it on to any of those, and none of them were clinically affected. And there's a few more, essentially tell the same story. Uh, two liters, so again, once you've got that, this is passed it on to two liters, consecutive liters. Uh, but with these two, there was none of them were clinically affected, right? So there is no obvious kind of equation that you can say, well, you will always get first letter, half of them will be seropositive, and half of those seropositive will be, will be clinically affected. There is no equation. It's kind of like tossing a, tossing a, a dice. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, that's unfortunate what, what is bad to say, but that's what it is. Uh, we have no, no, no real, uh, yeah, I don't have a crystal ball uh, to say it that way. Uh, so the, the numbers, essentially, they come from very few number of, of litters, are essentially that probably half of the puppies become congenitally infected if you've got a uh, positive mum. Uh, and that uh, probably half of those will become clinically affected, if at all. That's the worst case scenario. Uh, now, now, when you look at, so when you get a serology from a, a diagnostic lab, they'll give you the concentration very often. Not always, but some labs will. So concentration, how much antibodies does the bitch have uh, in its serum? And it can be used. Uh, to predict. And the prediction is weak, but there is. Uh, that if you got very low, the chances of passing it onto, onto puppies is low. If you got high, it's probably chances are bigger and more puppies will be affected. If you want to use that equation, it's out there. Some people challenge that. It's the best we got, right? So you can look. If your bitch has got one to thousands, then you got a good chance that really it will be happening. If you go below thousand, so hundreds, uh, then probably uh, one in ten, no more. Right? That's all I can tell you, no more. Uh, and of course, the more higher titer is, the more chances of clinically affected dogs you will have. So now, now back to Australia, kind of. This is generated based on international data, but Australian data are puzzling, and they puzzle me. Uh, so we've recently tested uh, about 500 dogs from Victoria, uh, and most of them were Melbourne, urban dogs, uh, all sorts of breeds, uh, no bias there. 30% uh, of them were positive, meaning 30%, one in every, three dogs is positive for, for Neospora. That would mean that there should be a lot of Neospora clinically affected dogs in Victoria. I don't have data for Queensland at all. I don't have access to, yes? Hi, so you're very much in the same ballpark. Uh, so why is that? Uh, so, so that's my question. And, and and, something, and the reason why, because, well, there was another study, even f further going back, um, 97, uh, and the percentage was five. As, uh, I'm talking about same location, same Melbourne place, uh, same cross-section across, across all, the, all the dogs, 5%. 200 versus 500, not much of a difference, uh, sample size. So something must have happened. Uh, uh, are we doing... 
uh, something different to our dogs. And now when you think of Neospora, what would be the difference? Are we feeding them more raw meat uh, or not? This could easily be behind this problem. Uh, so are you exposing the, the dog population to this, this parasite uh, by feeding them raw meat? I don't have the evidence. It's my kind of speculation. Uh, I don't have a better one. Uh, but that's what I'm suspecting, right? Uh, so now I'll show you what to actually expect. Now you can do proactively test your dogs, or test your bitch essentially, that's what you should. Uh, that's one thing, but maybe you haven't and now you're dealing with a, a case that actually uh, is out there or you're dealing, it's your litter and you've got a, a, a problem. So I'll show you how it looks, right? So this was a puppy uh, called Lucky. Um, and I'll let you watch it if it comes up. So this was six weeks. Uh, there's a Labrador. And this is what happens. The stiff legs kind of bunny hopping soon uh, and kind of can kind of bend the legs. Otherwise, bright puppy, that's the bunny hop. Uh, that's typically for it. And dragging its legs, can't lift them up. Easily someone could call it a trauma. Uh, uh, and so hopefully you call the vet. And a few weeks later, if you start aggressively, this is the same puppy at 10 weeks, so about five weeks later. Uh, and it will kind of use its back legs to jump on that desk. Uh, so that's what kind of, uh, that's how it looks. So uh, it's always traumatic for, for the, the breeder. Uh, so what could you do? What could the vet do? What uh, could you expect from it? I'll just stop that. So with this one, uh, the puppy was really high seropositive at that time and um, at that time I was worried that it might be just from mum uh, but it stayed like this uh, and was treated aggressively the moment they were the signs uh, it was, uh, and we had some information about it and said let's do this you have to start early the sooner you start the more neurons you save that's why I was trying to mention to you once you lose a neuron so almost every minute, every minute counts, right? So the moment you start now, you're probably saving every minute one neuron. Um, so that's why aggressive uh, initial uh, initiation is really important. Uh, so, so, I, so the, the mum had, I don't know, 12 puppies, let's say, uh, and I'll, one of them had the clinical signs, right? So that was this one number eight, let's say number eight, yeah, probably. Um, and there were a few others that were kind of positive or borderline positive. So this is, this is high positive, this is thousands, but these are kind of borderline. And I told you that antibodies come from mum, from the colostrum, and they slowly will kind of disappear. That's the borderline. So what I actually did with these, I said, well, I want to make sure uh, so I tested them again, all of them, at 10 weeks. And by 10 weeks, all these border lines were, were negative. And these stayed the same. Uh, but this one is negative, right? This guy, this guy remains negative for clinical signs. Totally happy, happy, healthy looking, looking puppy, yet highly positive. Uh, so what, what does that mean that there's Neospora involved? Well, the pups responded to treatment, or that individual pup responded to treatment, which is a good sign. Uh, but then we looked more. How can you actually do something about this? Well, you test mum. So we tested mum. Mum was positive. Thousands. Uh, and then we didn't end up there. We actually tested grandma as well. And that was positive as well. So now you're basically showing that sort of a pass through the, the mum and grandma. Uh, and that's... That's what you always have to, unfortunately, do. One test on one pub doesn't really tell you the whole story. You really have to look, and the vets should look with you throughout the whole situation, which is the whole litter, the mum, and we ignore dads. Males are there for just fun. That's it. Uh, uh, and, and so we need to look through mums, right? And that's the, that's the route uh, where, where it comes through. Uh, so now... Uh, 
essentially that's how we prove that it was transmission through through the the, the mums and grandma onto it. Uh, it's not guaranteed that it went through the grandma because grandma could have been infected through the meat as well at the same time they both. But it's just a suspicion that we got uh, as best we can. We can't tell. Again, that's where I'm running to the trouble. I can't tell when it happened. That number doesn't tell me when it happened. When it happened before or, uh, or, or yesterday. So now what you want to know is this as well. So what do you do? What do you do with mum like this? Uh, you got an option. Uh, the conservative option uh, that, that kind of the, the, the parasitologists recommend and is uh, you don't want to do more harm. You, you're really signing up to do welfare and you want to uh, save the life uh, or, or suffering. Uh, therefore, you, you, you basically desex the mum. You desex the bitch and uh, problem solved. Uh, doesn't mean that the mum will, will suffer anything, uh, part of not having, having litter uh, anymore. Uh, that's the recommended way. Uh, you can dare it if you convince the vet to monitor it. It's really, uh, is it uh, what you should do or not? I think it's very much lies between you and your vet uh, to discuss that issue because the risk is there. You can take the risk, you may not take the risk. Uh, we can talk about this later, uh, but what do we do with the pups? Uh, there is some recommendation that say that the moment you see one clinical affected dog, you should treat the whole litter uh, and mass. Uh, I'm against drugging animals for no reason, right? Uh, I think if the puppy is negative, it rem will very much remain negative, so I'm more for testing before uh, uh, drugging them with, with, with antibiotics for, for six to eight weeks. So I, I will only elect to, uh, to elect with this case, uh, the affected one. Uh, the one that is positive, that was the other one, the six, the, the middle one, uh, essentially I would recommend that the puppy is monitored. The moment there will be signs of a little bit of stiffness in back legs, go for it. Go for your lives, start immediately. But if there is no clinical sign, therefore the parasite is probably dormant doing nothing. So there is no need. Uh, the problem starts that you can either start treating that one as well, but when do you stop? There is no real stop because the clinical signs can come up for up to a year. So you would have to keep that pup for a year on it, which I don't think that's good. Uh, I would wait for the clinical signs and start immediately. Uh, for the other pups, they were negative, do nothing. They are happy, healthy, healthy guys. Uh, uh, they should enjoy the life. Uh, so that's very much uh, almost at the end. I go one minute, I go three minutes. Uh, what could be done for pups? Well, we just mentioned that. Uh, Mums should be tested before. If you've forgotten to test and now you're worried and the uh, the bitch is about to well, you can actually collect uh, the colostrum. That's a good material for testing as well. It's perfectly fine, it's very easy, or reasonably easy to collect, uh, and can be tested as well for, for essentially to know whether the mum is positive or not. Uh, the rest, you just monitor. Uh, be aware, uh, and, and see what, uh, what will come up. If the mum is positive, uh, I would be super careful. I would watch and watch. But not every litter will be affected, remember that. But if you see signs, go and do something. Uh, I would, even with the positive ones, I would bleed them before you give them away to make sure you know and you tell the, the new owners. It's best not to propagate this parasite on. So if it's any of those are becoming breeding bitches or potentially breeding bitches, I mean, they should be tested. And if they're positive, don't, don't, don't dare it, in a way, I would say. Uh, uh, because the consequences are bad for the, the new owners uh, already. Uh, so th there's a little bit of a red job. I got it in small, because really that's what the vets should do. They should uh, make the diagnosis based on not just one serology, but they should base it on a lot of the other uh, collateral things, history and mums and, and, and situation as past evidence as well. So uh, 
I know they know what to do. What about adults? There's a few questions that people ask me always about what about adults? It's very rare, very rare, very rare. That's what I would say. And it comes all shapes and sizes. There is no one equals one kind of clinical sign. So uh, it will be always on the last sort of a list of differentials for a vet, unfortunately. Um, so um, the majority remain asymptomatic, meaning majority, I mean all but one in a hundred thousand. Uh, and they may develop fulminant neosporosis, and uh, with that, is very uh, prognosis is very poor. So um, I won't go into detail of this because that's for vets uh, to deal with when they deal with your case. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no no solution almost at all in those cases. Uh, where does it come from? Don't forget that the bones that if you feed any of uh, your dogs with bones, that's where it. So prevention is simple here, uh, but it doesn't guarantee anything. It is don't feed the offal to your dogs, right? And I think that's almost the end. So I've got these four puppies here, and they've been thinking about Neospora. You can do one thing for them, test them, and then you know what will happen uh, if any of those are, are females, uh, whether they will pass it on or not. Uh, there's a few take-home messages. Take the guessing out of the equation, test your puppy, uh, test your dam, uh, and be prepared for what to do with, with uh, if you find the clinical signs that may associate with Neospora. So I think that's very much it. I think I'm fitting into an hour. <laughs>